welcome to the Old Time Radio Westerns. I'm your host, Andrew Rines, and let's get into this episode. This episode is going to be Challenge of the Yukon. Original air date is November 30th, 1949, and the title is 48 Hours to Pay. Hope you enjoy, and again, thanks for listening. Now, as gunshots echo across the windswept, snow-covered reaches of the wild northwest, Quaker popped wheat and Quaker popped rice, the breakfast cereal shot from guns, present the challenge of the Yukon. It's Yukon King, swiftest and strongest lead dog of the Northwest, blazing the trail for Sergeant Preston of the Northwest Mounted Police in his relentless pursuit of lawbreakers. On King, on your huskies. Gold. Gold discovered in the Yukon. A stampede to the Klondike in the wild race for riches. Back to the days of the gold rush. With Quaker puffed wheat and Quaker puffed rice, bringing you the adventures of Sergeant Preston and his wonder dog, Yukon King, as they meet the challenge of the Yukon. Listen, Quaker puffed wheat and Quaker puffed rice are the swellest tasting breakfast cereals you ever ate. Try a heaping bowl full of crisp, tender, delicious wheat or rice shot from gun. Topped with fruit and good, rich yellow cream. It's your deluxe breakfast, a taste treat that can't be beat. Fruit and smooth, rich cream on Quaker puffed rice or Quaker puffed wheat. Enjoy it tomorrow morning. Laura Amory was doing her weekly shopping at Joe Newton's general store in the mining settlement of Faro City. Joe had been taken to the hospital in Dawson, and during his absence, his helper was running the store. Well, here's your flower, Mrs. Amory. Now, will there be anything else? No, I guess not. Tell me, how's Joe getting along? Is he any better? No, I'm afraid not. Doctor says he'll have to go back to the States. Well, what about the store? Oh, Joe had to sell out to Bank of Peachum. Uh Banker Peachum. That's right. Peachum uh, just got back from Dawson this morning. The deal was closed at the hospital. He bought Joe out. Lock, stock, and barrel. Oh, dear. Well, what's the matter, Mrs. Amory? You look downright worried. I am worried. You see, Joe held my husband's note for quite a large sum of money. Joe held lots of IOUs. Seems like he'd grub staked half the sourdoughs in this neck of the woods. Well, what'll happen to all those IOUs? Well, Peachum took those over along with everything else in the store. But if you ask me, uh, he was more interested in getting his hands on those IOUs than he was in buying the store. What do you mean? A lot of those sourdoughs that borrowed money from Joe put up their claims as security. Now, they didn't mind doing that because they knew Joe would never foreclose on them. Now, Clint Peachum has got hold of their IOUs. Why, he'll grab every claim he can. Gracious, I, I hope it won't come to that. Laura Amory told her husband what had happened as soon as she got back to their cabin on Malamute Creek. John Amory received the news with dismay. Of all the confounded luck. When's the money due, John? On February 10th. The 10th? Well, that's only two days away. Don't I know it? How much cash can we scrape up altogether? Just what we have here in the cabin. Maybe a hundred dollars. But, John, if we can't pay, we'll lose our claim. What are we going to do? There's only one thing I can do, dear. I'll have to go to the bank and ask Clint Peacham for more time. A short time later, John Amory arrived at the Faro City Bank. He was greeted by Glenn Gardner, the young bank clerk. Well, hello there, John. Hello, Glenn. Is Peacham in? Why, yes, he's in his office right over there. Just knock on the door. Uh, thanks. Yes, come in, come in. Clint Peachum, an ex-gambler who had gone into the banking business, sat at his desk chewing on an unlighted cigar. He was a big man with a flowered waistcoat and carefully tended mustache. He greeted his visitor suavely. Well, Emily, what can I do for you? It's about some money that I owe Joe Newton. I, I hear you've taken over all of Joe's holdings. That's right, Jim. But, oh, I... what's the matter? Have a bad heart. It's acting up again, I'm afraid. 
Would you mind handing me that bottle of pills over there in the cabinet? Oh, sure. Here you are. Thank you. I'm sorry to interrupt you. Go ahead with what you were saying. Well, Joe Newton held my note for $1,500. The money's due on February 10th, two days from now. I've come to ask for more time. I'm sorry, Amy. But I see no reason for granting you an extension. Oh, my claim's good. You know that. It's one of the richest on Malamute Creek. You'll get your money and plenty of interest, too, right after the spring cleanup. Sorry, the money is due February 10th. Either pay up by that time, or I have to take over your claim. Oh, now, wait. Where am I going to lay my hands on that much money in 48 hours? That's your problem. Teach them, you thieving skunk. You're just using that note as an excuse to grab my claim. Amy, I don't take that kind of talk from any man. You've heard my final word. Either pay up by the 10th, or lose your claim. Now, get out. John Amory's face was tense with worry as he returned to his cabinet. You're back. What did Peachum say? Ah, uh, it's no use, honey. I guess we're licked. You mean he won't give us an extension on the note? It was a waste of time even asking him. Well, then we'll lose the claim. It looks that way. Unless we can lay our hands on $1,500 by Wednesday. Oh, someone's stopping outside. Why, it's Sergeant Preston and King. I'll let them in. All right, dear. Hello, Sergeant Preston. Hello, Mrs. Amory. King, old fella. Come on inside, both of you. Thanks. Come on. Howdy, Sergeant. Haven't seen you and King in a long time. Hello, John. Now take off your park and sit down. Why, thanks. I can't stay. I'm on my way to town. I stopped in to see how you're getting along. Well, uh... How's everything going? Not so good. It looks like I may lose my claim. Lose it? How so? I owed $1,500 to Joe Newton. Now that Joe is sold out to Bank of Peachum, I've got to pay up or he'll take over my claim. But your claim's worth a lot more than $1,500. What I saw of it last time I was here, it's worth more like $15,000. That's why Peachum's so anxious to foreclose. When's the money due? The day after the morning. Any of the banks in Dawson would lend you enough to pay off Peachum? Sure they would, son. But they'd have to send someone down to appraise the claim first. There's no time for that. 48 hours is barely long enough for me to go to Dawson and get back. Much less than wait till they go through all that red tape. Maybe that won't be necessary, John. What? what do you mean? If I write out a statement estimating the value of your claim, I think the bank will take my word for it. Sergeant, will you do that? I'll be glad to. Oh, John, then we won't have to lose the claim after all. You bet we won't, honey. Thanks to Sergeant Preston. I'll get the team hitched up and start for Dawson right away. The following day, Flora Amory encountered Clint Peachum on the main street of Faro City. The banker greeted her with a sneering smile. Good day, Mrs. Amory. I trust your husband hasn't forgotten that his note falls due tomorrow? He hasn't forgotten, Mr. Peachum. You'll get your money. Indeed. May I ask where he proposes to lay his hands on $1,500 on such short notice? He's borrowing the money from the bank in Dawson City. <laughs> I'm afraid your husband is in for this slight disappointment. Before any bank will lend him money on his claim, they'll insist on sending down a man to appraise it. Maybe your husband didn't know that. Oh, on the contrary. He was quite aware of that fact. That's why he took along a statement from Sergeant Preston, estimating the value of his claim. What's that? John will get back from Dawson sometime tomorrow for forenoon. He'll drop around to your office and pay off the note as soon as he gets home. Goodbye, Mr. Peachum. Clint Peachum returned to his bank, furious to think that John Amory's claim might slip out of his grasp. He was still scowling a short time later when a tough-looking sourdough named York entered his office. Well, what do you want, York? Same thing a lot of other people want, what I've been hearing. What do you mean? I owe Joe Newton some money, about $600. Money's due next week. I was wondering if you could give me some more time to pay you back. Same old story, huh? Why should I give you any more time? Well, you know you'll get paid sooner or later. Well, I put up my claim as security when I borrowed the money. <laughs> I've seen that claim of yours. I doubt if there's $600 worth of gold left in it. If I don't foreclose on you next week, I'll probably never get the money. Now, wait a minute, Peachum. You try foreclosing on me. You and I'm not... wait a minute. Maybe I might make a deal with you at that. What kind of a deal? I need someone to pull a certain job for me. 
If you'll handle it, I'll tear up that note of yours, and on top of that, I'll guarantee the job will net you at least fifteen hundred dollars cash. Fifteen hundred, eh? And I could use some cash right now. The job's not particularly risky, but you need a gun. Are you interested? Keep talking. The man whom we both know is in Dawson City right now. He has to be back in town here by tomorrow. That means he'll be traveling all night. I want him held up and robbed somewhere on the trail. And the farther away from Pharaoh City, the better. I don't savvy, Pitchum. What do you get out of this? Never mind that. All you have to do is take his money before he gets to town. You're sure he's going to be carrying 1500 bucks on him? At least that much. Well, what about him? All right, it's a deal. Who is it I'm supposed to hold up? The man I'm talking about is John Amory. We'll continue our story in just a moment. Say, tomorrow morning, you'll go for this family breakfast treat. Crisp, nourishing, swell-tasting Quaker Puff rice or Quaker Puff wheat. The ready-to-serve cereal shot from gun. Oot, man. In the name of the queen, what's going on here? A Mountie. Hey, and you've seen a Mountie before, have you not? Oh, sure. Fact is, I'm pretty well acquainted with the Mounties in the Yukon. I am new in this territory. Whatever the shooting going on, man, yes, I'm... Yes, sir. Good. But that shooting you heard now is just me explaining about the keenest tasting breakfast ever. I... I mean rice or wheat shot from guns. Okay, that's a new kind of shooting to me, man. Well, you see, we load huge guns with choice, sun-ripened, premium grains of rice or wheat. Then these guns are exploded. <laughs> Out come big, giant grains, eight times normal size. They're magnified, crispified. Shot through and through with bang-up nut-like flavor, too. That's why Quaker puffed rice and Quaker puffed wheat are so good to eat. Good man, that sounds mighty tasty. And for breakfast, lunch, or supper, all you do is pour out a bowlful right from the package. No cooking. Just add milk or cream and top with your favorite fruit. Ah, that's for me, lad. And what's more, Quaker puffed rice and Quaker puffed wheat are nourishing. They furnish added health values of restored natural grain amounts of vitamin B1, niacin, and iron. Ah. Ah, lad, those extras appeal to me, too. And, fellas and girls, here's a tip for you. Tell Mom delicious Quaker puffed rice and Quaker puffed wheat is never sold in bags or bulk. To get the original crisp, fresh rice or wheat shot from guns, always buy the big red and blue package with the smiling Quaker man on the front. Ask for both delicious kinds today. Now to continue our story. When John Amory arrived in Dawson, he went straight to the Yukon Territorial Bank and arranged for a loan of $1,500. Then he rented a hotel room and snatched several hours sleep. Early in the afternoon, he left Dawson and started back to Faroe City, planning to travel all night with only an occasional halt for rest. Mush! Mush, you husky! Mush! Shortly after midnight, Amory was driving his team along the banks of a frozen creek. Suddenly, a masked man with a gun stepped out from a screen of underbrush and shouted, Stop your team! Ho! Oh, oh, you! Ho! Oh. Now get your hands up! Huh? What do you want? What do you think I want? Where'd you keep your money? I... I haven't got any. We'll see about that. Don't try any funny stuff when I'm searching you. Oh, wait a minute. Hmm. Let's see what's in this envelope. <laughs> so you haven't got any money on you, huh? You can't take that. I need that money to pay off a debt. Now, ain't that just too bad? Whip up your team and get moving. Listen, you can't get away you with it. You heard what I said. I'll get moving before this gun goes off. All right. Mush! 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 Late the following morning, John Amory arrived home at his cabin on Malamute Creek. His wife broke down and sobbed when she heard about the robbery. If Peachum had anything to do with this, so help me, I'll get that skunk if it's the last thing I ever do. Oh, revenge won't help. 
And even if Peachum is responsible, we'll never be able to prove it. We're not licked yet, honey. Where are you going? I'm going to town and report the robbery to Sergeant Preston. A short time later, Sergeant Preston listened as John Amory voiced his suspicions. That hold-up man must have known I'd be coming that way. Ordinarily, he'd never find anyone out in the trailer that time of night. Not in wintertime, certainly. Are you sure that Peachum knew about your trip to Dawson? Positive. He spoke to my wife in town yesterday, and she told him the whole business. He certainly had a reason for wanting the money stolen from him. Well, now, let's assume for the sake of argument that Peachum did hire someone to pull this job. You said the holdup occurred shortly after midnight, and you got home around 11 o'clock this morning. That's right, Sergeant. And if the holdup man got his orders from Clint Peachum, he must have started out early yesterday afternoon. Say two or three o'clock at the very latest. Yeah, I guess so, but... What good does that do us? What time did your wife talk to Peachum yesterday? Oh, it was right after lunch, she said. Must have been 1 or one thirty, I suppose. In other words, Peachum had two hours or less to pass the word along to the holdup man. It shouldn't be hard to find out who he talked to during that time. My golly, Sergeant, you're right. Let's go over to the bank, John. Glenn Gardner, the young bank clerk, was alone when Sergeant Preston and John Amory entered the bank. Hello there, Sergeant Preston. Hello, John. Hello, Glenn. Feature in his office? Why, no, he isn't, Sergeant. He just went out to lunch. Maybe you can answer a few questions for me, Glenn. I'll try. What time did Peachum get back from lunch yesterday? Oh, same time he always does, about uh, 1.15 or so. Did he leave the bank any time during the afternoon? No. No, he was uh, here right up until closing time at 6 o'clock. Did he talk to anyone in his private office during that time? Yes. He had several visitors. Huh? Who do you see before 3 o'clock? Let me see. Uh, first, there was a sourdough named York. Maybe you know him. Yes, I do. What did he want? Well, he was one of the people who owed Joe Newton money. I think he came around to ask for an extension on his note. Did he get it? Well, I don't know for sure, but I reckon he must have. Why so? Well, when most people come around to ask for an extension, Mr. Peachum turns them down, and they go away scowling like the dickens. Mm-hmm. But when York left, he was smiling like the cat that ate the canary. Who else did Peachum talk to? Well, the next one after York was uh, Widow Casey. She wanted to pay off a mortgage. And uh, then about an hour later, there was Father LeClaire. He's trying to raise money for a new Indian mission. I guess that's about all before 3 o'clock. He uh, didn't see anyone else till about 4.30 or 5. Thanks, Glenn. That's all I wanted to know. Oh, uh, by the way, don't mention to Peachum that I was here. Anything you say, Sergeant. All right, goodbye. Goodbye, Sergeant. John. Looks like York's our man. That's even poor kid. His cabin's over on Lucknow Creek. Let's pay him a visit. I think the team can get us there and back before the bank closes. It was mid-afternoon when Sergeant Preston halted his team in front of York's cabin. Okay. Come on, John. We'll see what York has to say for himself. Right. King trotted beside his master as the two men walked up to the door of the cabin. Hello, York. I'd like to ask you a few questions, if you don't mind. All right, all right. I think we can talk better inside. All right. What's on your mind? John, does York's voice sound like the voice of the man who held you up? Held him up? Sure does, Sergeant. Say, what kind of a frame up is this? Where were you last night, York? Right here in my cabin. You didn't hold up John Amory on the trail between Farrell City and Dawson? Well, of course I didn't. Who says I did? What did you and Clint Peachum talk about at the bank yesterday? Well, I asked him to give me more time to pay back the money I owed Joe Newton. Oh? What did Peachum say? Why, uh, well, he said, okay. He said I could wait till after spring cleanup. That's funny. Peachum isn't usually quite so generous. Or did you promise to return the favor in some way? Now, listen, Preston, I don't know what you're driving at. But I'm telling you, I had nothing to do with any holdup. So don't go trying to hang any phony charges on me. If you're innocent, you won't mind if I search your cabin, and maybe I'd better begin by searching you. Hey, 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 now, wait a minute. Stand still. That's better. All right, I guess you haven't got the money on you. No, I haven't got anywhere else either. We'll see about that. John, you can help me search. Right, sir. Sergeant Preston and John Amory began to search for the stolen money. York stood by sullenly until the sergeant walked over to his bunk. I'd better take a look under his bedroll. Realizing that the game was up, York began edging silently backward. His gun belt was looped over a hook on the wall. Meanwhile, Sergeant Preston was saying... John, I think I found the money. 
Sergeant, you're right. That's it. King was on the opposite side of the room from York. He was watching his master, but his keen ears caught the sound of York's stealthy movement. As York's hand darted out toward the holster hanging on the wall, King gave a warning growl. The sergeant whirled around and fired in the nick of time. Ah, man alive, sergeant, what a draw. You shot the gun right out of his hand. It uh, wouldn't have happened that way if that mutt hadn't warned him. Never mind the post-mortems, York. Just kick your gun over this way. Uh, what's the difference? Probably busted. I'll check on that personally, if you don't mind. Go ahead and kick it over this way. Oh, all right. That's better. John, huh? take the money and count it. Make sure it's the same amount you drew from the bank. All right, let's see. This is it, Sergeant. No doubt about it. Fifteen bills, all hundred-dollar denominations. You got nothing on me. That's my own money, and you can't prove any different. Can't we? In case it never occurred to you, the bank in Dawson will have the serial numbers of these bills. Well, York, you ready to confess? All right. I guess you got me. Couldn't Peach and put me up to it. The whole thing was his idea. He told me if I robbed Amory, he'd cancel the note I owed him. Very well, York. You're under arrest in the name of the Queen. Now, get on your parker. We're going back to town and have a little talk with Clint Peacham. Glenn Gardner, the young bank clerk, was just preparing to lock up the front door of the bank when he saw the sergeant holding his sled outside the barred window. Sergeant Preston is stopping outside. You mean he's coming into the bank? I guess he must be. John Amory and that uh, fellow York are with him. Say, it looks as though York is handcuffed. What's that? I said it looks as though York is handcuffed. Oh, yes, yeah, sure. Well, uh, when they come in, send them in my office. Meanwhile, outside the bank, John Amory was saying to Sergeant Preston, Are you sure York won't get away if we leave him out here, Sergeant? You better not try getting away, not while King's guarding him. That's right, boy, watch him. Don't let him make a move while we're gone. Uh, don't worry. Come on, John. Howdy, Sergeant. You're just in time. We were just getting ready to close up for the day. Beach him in? Oh, yes, he's in his office. Go right in. Thanks. Uh, it's you, Sergeant. And my uh, young friend, Amory. What can I do for you, gentlemen? John Amory has come to pay off his note. When that's taken care of, I'll have something to say to you. I have the money right here. Well, that's fine. Oh, uh, Glenn, will you come here a second? Yes, sir. Bring me that note of John Amory, eh? Sure thing, Mr. Peter. Now then, Amory, would you like to hand over the money? Uh-huh. There you are. It's all in hundreds. Thank you. Five. And Fifteen. Yes, indeed, it's all here. Fifteen hundred dollars. Here's the note, Mr. Peacham. Thank you. Just stay close the door as you go out, please. I'll uh, cancel your note, Emily, and give it back to him. There you are. Paid in full. By golly, Sergeant Floor will be mighty happy once he sees this. I'll bet you will. You said you had something to tell me, Sergeant. Would you mind telling me now? I'll be glad to, Peacham. You're under arrest in the name of the Queen. Oh, what's that? Uh, you must be joking. You won't think so when you're behind bars. But he, what's he charge against me? You hired a sourdough named York to hold up John Amory and rob him of $1,500. Uh, that's preposterous. You can't prove a thing against me. No use bluffing, Peachum. York's confessed. He's outside on my sled right now, wearing what you'll soon be wearing, a pair of handcuffs. Uh, oh. What's wrong? It's his heart, Sergeant. He had an attack last time I was oh. here. Yes, you're right, Amory. It's my heart, eh? I guess the shock was too much for me. Sergeant, if you'll just hand me that bottle of pills over on the cabinet. All right. As the sergeant turned away, Peachum suddenly reached under a pile of papers on his desk and jerked out a gun. Sergeant, look out! Oh, put up your hands, Bristol. Oh, your heart attack was just a fake. Yes, it's right. I suspected you might be coming here to arrest me when Glenn saw you pull up outside. So I took the precaution of placing this gun in easy reach. And what do you think you're going to do now? You'll find out quick enough. First of all, you're going to stick your head out the door and ask Glenn to bring York into my office. And if I refuse? I'm a desperate man, Preston. This heart of mine won't stand a prison sentence. If you don't do what I tell you, so help me, I'll put a bullet through your head and shoot my way out of here. Now, go ahead and tell Glenn what I said. Maybe you better do it, Sergeant. All right. Glenn? Yes? York is outside on my sled. He's wearing handcuffs. 
Would you mind bringing him into the office, please? You bet, Sergeant. I'll close the door again. You're being mighty foolish, Peachum. I'd advise you to put down that gun. Thank you. I think I'll hang on to it for a while. You haven't a chance of escaping the law. On the contrary. I think I have a very good chance, you see, Sergeant. I have a plan all figured out. Really? When York comes in, unlock his handcuffs. And have him tie and gag Emery and my clerk, young gardener, so they can't spread the alarm after we leave. I see. And what about me? <laughs> you come along with us as a hostage. After we've cleaned out the safe, of course. Of course. Just how far do you think you'll get before the police catch up with you? I think we'll get all the way to the border. And if they should catch up with us, you'll never live to see me behind bars. Let's come in. As the door opened, Preston began moving off to one side of the room. Where do you think you're going, Preston? That's right, Peachum. You'd better keep your eye on me. With a sudden leap, King cleared the desk and hurled himself at Peachum. Where'd he come from? Preston, get him away. Have his gun, John. You bet I will. All right, King. Hungard fellow, I think he's had enough. Oh, that happened. I still don't understand you. Where did that dog come from? Before I came in the bank, I told King to guard York. Once my dog King gets that kind of an order, he never lets his prisoner out of his sight. That's why I knew he'd be coming into the office along with York and Glenn. Yes, sir, King. You really saved our lives. It's not the first time you've saved my life, is it, King boy? I guess it won't be the last time, even though this case is closed. In just a moment, Sergeant Preston will give you a preview of Friday's adventure. Quaker puffed wheat and Quaker puffed rice are never sold in bags or bulk. As Mother knows, quality comes first in a food. That's why the famous breakfast cereals, Quaker puffed wheat and Quaker puffed rice, are made from only the premium grains of wheat or rice. So to get the original crisp, fresh wheat or rice shot from guns, always buy the big red and blue Quaker packages. The packages with the smiling Quaker man on the front. Get the one and only delicious Quaker puffed wheat and Quaker puffed rice. Never sold in bags or bulk. Listen Friday when Sergeant Preston and Yukon King meet the challenge of the Yukon in the case of the Outlaw's Twin. The man who had shot me was in jail. He'd confessed, and witnesses had positively identified him. But King gave no indication of ever having seen him before. That made me certain that we had the wrong man. When we set out to find the real murderer, we had to fight a desperate battle in the woods north of Rainbow Creek. Be sure to hear this exciting adventure Friday. These radio dramas, a feature of the challenge of the Yukon Incorporated, are created and produced by George W. Trendle, directed by Fred Flowerday, and supervised by Charles D. Livingston. The part of Sergeant Preston is played by Paul Sutton. They are brought to you every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at the same time by Quaker Puffed Wheat and Quaker Puffed Rice. The breakfast cereal shot from guns. Remember, for delicious hot breakfast, enjoy Quaker Oats. The giant of the cereals is Quaker Oats. Delicious, nutritious, makes you feel ambitious. The giant of the cereals is Quaker Oats. And here's why Quaker Oats is called the giant of the cereals. There's more growth, more endurance in oatmeal than any other whole grain cereal. So make your hot breakfast... Nourishing Quaker Oats. Quaker and Mother's Oats are the same. This is J. Michael wishing you goodbye, good luck, and good health from Quaker Puffed Wheat and Quaker Puffed Rice. So long. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company.
This has been a presentation of otrwesterns.com, and we hope you enjoyed. Please take some time to like and rate our shows in your favorite podcast application. Follow us on Facebook by going to otrwesterns.com slash Facebook. Join in the conversation by going to otrwesterns.com slash Discord. And don't forget to send us an email, podcast at otrwesterns.com. This episode is copyright under the attribution, not commercial, share like copyright. For more information, go to otrwesterns.com slash copyright. Have a great day, and again, thanks for listening.